Oh, Notre Dame, how you doing? Hello, Hands Bookstore. Uh, I am told to remind you there's a couple seats higher up front. If some lucky people are working, looking for our actual seats, there's a one, two, four up here in the front. Don't be shy. You guys want some seats? If we are shy, should we leave? All right, I'll go ahead and get started then. So I'm Joyelle McSweeney, and I'm in the Department of English in the Program of Creative Writing, and I see a lot of familiar faces out there, which is awesome. I will be counting you and making sure. Um, it is such a pleasure to welcome Manuel Paul Lopez here to Notre Dame, where it has been our privilege to award him with the Ernest Sandin Prize for Poetry, and in conjunction, of course, with the University of Notre Dame Press, which is a uh, a wonderful partner in the creative writing program, and a partner that has really built the profile of the creative writing program nationally and even internationally, so it is a true partnership. And it's very exciting to have Paul Lopez here as the sort of, uh, I don't want to say fruit of our labor, <laughs> that's a little, it's a little suggestive of our labor, but um, as a show of what we can build when we work together, it's exciting. So the manuscript for, uh, that won the prize was for Paul's second book, The Yearning Feed, here realized in book form. A um, very beautiful and awesome looking book, by the way. And it beat out many other manuscripts to win this prize. And again, it was published by Notre Dame Press earlier this year. And it's this book and this poet that we're here to celebrate tonight. So the prize is named after Ernest Sandin. And Ernest Sandin was a professor of English here at the University of Notre Dame from 1946 until his retirement in 1978. He was an award-winning teacher. His poems appeared in such journals as the Hudson Review, Poetry, and the New Yorker. And he published six volumes of poetry in his lifetime and served as an emeritus professor of English here at Notre Dame until his death in 1997. Uh, he has many strong friends with strong memories and warm memories of him here. And his collected poems, uh, 1953 to 1994, was published in 2001. And I should say, I also did some reading of Ernest Sandin's poetry in the last few days, getting ready for tonight. And I thought it has such a warmth to it and such a, um, an interest in the human and in, in a precise naming of the human and, and specific uh, people and even um, the connection between the familial, the family, and uh, something like the family in Christ, maybe, and in Mary, that reminded me a little bit of the way the family works um, in Paul Lopez's work. So it'd be interested to see if those of you who are familiar with Ernest Sandin's poetry see this kind of human continuum between the two works. Now, uh, Manuel Paul Lopez, who I understand goes by Paul, was born and raised along the U.S.-Mexican border region in El Centro, California. And he received degrees from the University of California, from the University of San Diego, and from San Francisco State University. He teaches humanities at the awesomely named High Tech High. I can't get enough of High Tech High <laughs> and Point Loma. And his first book, The Death of Mexican and Other Poems, was published by Bear Star Press in 2006. And this, The Yearning Feed, from University of Notre Dame Press, winner of the Ernest Sandin Prize, is the second book. And I, along with my colleague Orlando Menes, uh, was one of the judges that chose this manuscript to be published. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what set this manuscript apart from the others. I admire Paul Lopez's poems for their double scale, the contrast between their sweep, like their huge sweep, and their pinpoint accuracy. I love his long, speedy poems with their velocity and their altitude, their ability to stay aloft and to consistently surprise. Sometimes they're pyrotechnic, and sometimes they're more like a yo-yo trick. In the tight circumference of that yo-yo, or in the pulmonary ex expanse of the sky, dazzling and fleeting portraits whiz by. Portraits of friends, of families, of great poets and artists who veer into the verbal space of his poems only to veer away. Figures from, uh, sounds like from his high school, a friend called Rudy, but also the great Chilean poet Zorita, the great Russian poet Mayakovsky, as well as Apollinaire. Actually, in his sweep and in his volubility and in his momentum, I'm reminded of the Cubist poets Apollinaire and Sendrar and the futurist Mayakovsky, as well as the resourcefulness and the conviviality of Zorita. Another kind of productive doubleness in uh, Paul Lopez's work is the interplay between the truly planetary reach of his context for poetry and the sense that El Centro is a definite, can be a definite center of the arts universe as much as any other metropolis, this particular place where he grew in his family um, in a border region of California 
could be as important to literature as any Paris or New York um, or Tokyo, I guess. Um, and, I, and when I was thinking about that, about how something that maybe is outside of a major metropolis could just serve as a center for art anyway, I thought of the Thomas Tranströmer quote, uh, Tranströmer, the Nobel Prize winner, said, truth always happens at a border, and it's only at a border that we know the truth. So that's an interesting question. If in the 21st century, it, it's at the border that we really feel the truth can finally be seen, can be sensed and recognized. But back to me. As a reader, I am caught up in the way certain stars ride and rise in the firmament of Lopez's work only to depart. But other stars say stanza after stanza, forcing the poem to make space to accommodate them, like the Mona Lisa or a friend named Rudy, or even the year 1984 that occurs again and again as anaphora in the poem and forces the poem to make more of itself to somehow accommodate this glamorous um, repetum. Yet in this busy and electrified celestial model, it is the speaker himself who remains somehow elusive. He is the light that can bounce off all this terrain and light it up and never completely fix his own image, never completely reveal himself. Thus, Paul Lopez's poems are both accessible and mysterious, both a particle and a wave and something else, less like a yo-yo trick than like the trickiness of contemporary physics, spooky action at a distance, entanglement, superimposition, the dark matter, and the light. I'd like to conclude my introduction by reading I kind of outsourced this introduction by asking my undergraduate students to write some blurbs for Paul Lopez because they read his book, and so their quiz, I gave them the quiz, which was to write some blurbs from this book. And um, here's a few of the choice blurbs. So uh, these are one of my students. I will withhold their names, but if you really want to know, email me. <laughs> okay, so this student, these, this pair of students write, Lopez's weathered voice erodes the cultural landscape of the Imperial Valley with the tough delicacy and fluidity of an unexpected rain. His unique portraits frame his narrative tone with a genuine originality. And these students write, reading Lopez's work is like walking down the corridor of a cruise ship, yet seeing different scenery out of every window. Yet each perspective overlaps and creates a combination as vibrant as seeing color for the first time, as distinct and complete as a mural telling multiple interconnected tales. And these students write, Lopez's use of language to illustrate his metaphors for his world is like milk in the abrasive coffee of societal stereotypes. <laughs> Check. Lots. Go big, kids. Uh, he captures the complexity of the American experience uh, by pushing through boundaries of form, person, and mind. So those are pretty high expectations, but I have reason to believe that the work of Paul Lopez can really meet those expectations. So please, Notre Dame community, gather me, join me in welcoming Paul Lopez, a poet who we are helping along uh, to help his considerable talent and insight find more and more of a place in the world. I think we should be proud of ourselves a little bit and very proud of Paul Lopez. So. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. <laughs> First, I want to thank the Creative Writing Department for, for the award and, and the, the opportunity to even submit to the prize. Um, of course, I have to thank Joyelle McSweeney and Orlando Menes, the judges of this prize. It was, it was just amazing. Um, they, were, they were the reason why I even submitted it, just uh, to have an opportunity to pass the manuscript through them. Um, so to actually get the call was amazing. Um, I think I, I will, and also thank you so much for those wonderful blurbs. Those were incredible. <laughs> those were beautiful. Um, tonight, what I wanted to do is begin with uh, three, three or so uh, new, newer works, and then I'll get into the book. Is that cool? Okay. All right. Um, the first one I'm going to read is a poem called Emerson's Lament. Um, as in Ralph Waldo Emerson, and uh, it was a line that I, that I had read in high school as a junior, and uh, it, I had never, um, it, it always stuck with me for some reason, and many years later it worked itself into a poem. Um, as we know, as we, as we sit here, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the, the NSA and, and its, uh, the surveillance um, society that we're currently living in and, and, and everything that comes with that. So this is uh, speaking to that. I would say. 
Emerson's lament. Nonetheless, I've become a professional cartographer. I work for the government. More specifically, I work for the military. My maps could locate an early Egyptian lip balm on the edges of the Mansala Lake if one needed to be found. Most recently, the US Navy used my maps to capture the, a runaway firefly that escaped from a research lab in San Diego, California. Authorities caught up to the tiring insect 37 and a half miles into the Pacific and returned it to service the next day despite its exhaustion, despite its refusal to offer light. It died one week later, but that is another story. My work with map making was adopted by Roger L. Easton during his earliest developments of the global positioning system. Since then, one might say I've become a legend within the community. I've arm wrestled the elusiveness of fugitive discoveries and won. I am, as Emerson once famously wrote, the transparent eyeball. I am nothing, I see all. All right, I'm also working on, on a series called The YouTube Narratives. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, my, my wife's grandmother recently gave me an accordion that belonged to her, her, her father. And he gave me this, it's this great hunk of beautiful metal <laughs> and machinery and movable parts. It's been sitting in the closet for a while and, and one day I just decided, well, you know, what good is that? So I, I decided to pick it up and try to learn how to play it. So uh, taking a cue from my students, you know, you can find out how to do anything on YouTube, right? Just the tutorials are amazing. So I said, I just plugged in how to play an accordion, right? So, so of course, all these tutorials came up. Um, so now I can play this blasting C chord. <laughs> I, just, I just honk that thing. <laughs> That's all I do. But, um, especially when my wife and I kind of, anyways. <laughs> so anyways, this one's about Metallica. And more specifically, Metallica's uh, song, Fade to Black. Do we have any Metallica fans in, in, in the audience? All right. You know that tune, Fade to Black? Yeah. It's, 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 oh. <laughs> it's heartbreak. Um, so it comes from that. <laughs> Today, I will YouTube how to play Metallica's Fade to Black on the guitar. I will practice the song for hours, and once I learn how to play the heartbreaking intro, I will learn the chord progressions. In time, maybe weeks, most likely months, I will add vocals. And once I've learned the complete song, including the best outro ever, I will close my eyes and sit very still on a short stool in a shopping center food court with the guitar spread across my lap like Michelangelo's Pieta in the Vatican. With the guitar on my lap and with my eyes closed, I will secretly hope that someone standing there is moved enough by this silent and arduous performance that he willingly removes a mallet from his backpack and beats me silly with it like the Hungarian geologist Laszlo Tok did when he nearly did Michelangelo's masterpiece in, in 1972. Enraged and horrified, the city council will mobilize to protect the site, ordering immediate security precautions such as cameras, railings, and limited viewing times. Bludgeoned, but still breathing, mind you, I will soon be protected days after in that food court by a transparent but foolproof bulletproof encasement with two burly guards standing on each side of my guitar and me. Headsets attached to a kiosk nearby will be made readily available for visitors to listen to Metallica's fade to black as they observe the anonymous man and his broken guitar. <laughs> visitors will also be inspired to close their eyes under the influence of the scene, some singing along to the music, others mouthing the lyrics softly. All will point, however, raising their shaky fingers at the blue beaded tears squeezing reluctantly from the corners of the beaten man's eyes, mistaking them quite possibly for tears of despair, such as when one realizes everything will inevitably fade to black. But in this fleeting moment of communal introspection, Hot goddamn neon joy will suddenly flower from our faces as it often has if we can truly remember it as having done so. Overcoming all of us at that moment as if Metallica's fade to black had never been written, as if it had never even existed. We mastering the song, finally. All right, 
and there's, there's a bunch of those YouTube ones. <laughs> um, so I'm going to get into the... No. Um, so, some of these things, a lot of other pieces come from the valley, they're centered in the Imperial Valley, Southern California, um, desert community right next to the border, um, and it's very flat uh, agriculture community. Um, and there's a lot of sheep around, and that's probably where I got this image from. Um, so that's where, where I grew up. So a lot of this does come from that. Can you share with us a unique story about your hometown in the Imperial Valley? I heard a story once about a sheep. It's actually a story about a flock of sheep, but I'll get to that in a minute. This infamous sheep that's now eternally ingrained in Imperial Valley folklore committed suicide one day when it decided to climb a ditch bank near an alfalfa field just outside of El Centro. Long story short, when it reached the top, this rebellious creature that will forever remain nameless descended the other side without one bit of hesitation. A real chingon, man. Stoically, it marched into the abyss as if Charles Bronson had costumed himself in sheep's clothing is what I'm trying to tell you. But it didn't take long before it quickly lost its footing and tumbled into the water, the current like a crazed washing machine cycle, churning and sucking simultaneously as the borrego left behind a tiny dust storm of hoof and wool kicked up in its wake, limbs splashing feverishly as it raised its little lips toward an orange sky that sizzled above to shout one last declaration in sheep. If you've grown up in the Imperial Valley, you know to tread carefully around various waterways because of the vigorous undercurrents that can yank you underwater faster than you can cry. Oh, shit. The group left behind stared blankly with eyes like dark, tender buttons. But it didn't take long, you know, before they followed suit, climbing, fatefully reaching that same dire immensity as their beloved comrade. In ranks, a large flock of woolly sheep drowned themselves by following that first sheep's desire to see what was on the other side, or to sip from that mythical Colorado river water that has quenched the Imperial Valley Desert for nearly a century, or to protest poor labor conditions that have assaulted their backs like electrified machetes, or simply to cool off, who knows. Maybe it was a vision the sheep had, somehow fulfilling some sort of sheep-derived prophecy in the same deranged tradition as America's most elusive cult leaders. Maybe it was just bad alfalfa that induced a wild hallucination. Maybe they were the sacrific sacrificial lambs intent on teaching us something. I've always been captivated by the story, regardless of its fact or fiction. I prefer not knowing, though I do wonder why on occasion why did that sheep break ranks, and did it know they would all follow? That's based on a story I really heard. That Matt is, <laughs> this one sheep decided to take this plunge. I don't know if it's true or not. Do one more sheep poem. Not go over my, my obsession with sheep. This is actually, there's a number of poems in here. The, the, the collection's called The Yearning Feed, but there are a number of them uh, in title pieces, I guess you could say. And this is one of the, the, the pieces called The Yearning Feed. Um, if you were a nanny goat, I'd watch. <laughs> and, and another thing about the, about the, the Yearning Feed poems, they're, they're all based on the conditional statement, right? The if-then sort of thing. Okay. The Yearning Feed. If you were a nanny goat, I'd watch you from afar, maybe from behind a hay bale or a firm stack of sandbags, like the ones we used to look for in old war movies. Nonetheless, my safety would come first. With binoculars, I'd find your lovely nanny goat lips and daydream about long, interminable conversations with you, about the nature of things, nanny goat things, of grass, and the yearning matter that feeds it. Together we'd fertilize the air with our secrets, then watch scissors grow. Carlos's moms used to warn us about staring directly into the growling solesazo, 
A desert sun, she said, shouldn't ever be messed with. That fat ass in the sky will turn on you like a wild turkey in November. <laughs> with this, she paused, examining her fingernails like a cool-headed Shaolin Kung Fu master. Slowly, methodically, shit, it's kind of like all of us in this valley, she continued. Our don't fuck with us attitude would have made Miles Davis stutter. For effects, Carlos's mom's balled her hands into two bony fists and shook them in our faces. The sun's power is raw, mijitos. The thing will bleach your eyes out in a second if it catches you staring without its permission. Does that mean we'll go blind, we fired back, afraid of the impending danger, knowing our curiosity would eventually get the best of us. We'd be blinded by 12. In response, Carlos's mom glanced from left to right then shook her fists in our faces again and scowled, revealing her famous perfect teeth and her equally famous dimple that winked from the depths of her cheek, an indentation of seduction that broke men like Chicano kryptonite from the Imperial Valley to Fresno, California. With our heads down, this might be the reason why we were so damn good at soccer. The evening you and I heard, the border patrol found the bodies of a young man and woman lying down, locked in an eternal embrace near an ocotillo plant they used for shelter during a blistering August day in a remote corner of the Imperial Valley Desert. No water, shoes chewed up by the journey north, clothes tattered. We sat in silence at our dinner table and questioned everything we had already thanked our God for. When the powers that be decided to change the Imperial Valley's area code from 619 to 760, the person most affected was Hector. 619 was tattooed on his neck in beautiful and prominent Old English one intoxicated evening as he promised to smoke any fool who claimed anything but these three fateful numbers. In an instant, Hector's tattoos became a target on his neck for those who also had tattoos, freshly inked tattoos, sometimes on those who vaguely resembled his friends. 